Okay, so let's start digging into how interrupts work by digging into the interrupt descriptor table. And just like we dealt with the global descriptor table before we started looking at the entries in this table, same way here we're going to look at the table overall before we look at the entries. So how is the IDT found? Well, it turns out there's an IDT register named IDTR. Amazing. So when an interrupt occurs, the hardware automatically consults the IDTR and from there it finds the IDT itself. Then it's going to look for an offset in the IDT that is going to be a particular index inside of it for a particular interrupt. Then it's going to push the saved stack information onto the stack using the TSS, using the stack address specified by the TSS. And then from within the particular entry in the IDT, it's going to pull out a CS and RIP that are going to be used as the uh, new executable state. So IDTR looks exactly like the GDTR in that it has a 64-bit portion that says here's the base of the table and a 16-bit portion that says here is the limit or the size of the table. And just like the GDTR had a LGDT, here we have an LIDT, which loads the 10 bytes from memory into the IDT register. And take a wild guess about whether this is going to be user space or kernel space. And it's user space, again. So the dichotomy continues with privileged instruction to write to the IDT register and unprivileged to read it. Also, again, Windabug does its own little Windabugism for a pseudo register, the IDTL, that says that holds just this bottom 16-bit portion of what is actually an 80-bit register. So just like with the GDT, the IDTR has a base that points at the start of some table that has a bunch of data structures in it and a limit that specifies the top end of that data structure. So the IDT is an array of less than or equal to 256 16 byte descriptors based on that limit field. And 0 through 31 are reserved by Intel for their own usage for architectural specific exceptions and interrupts, whereas 32 and above are values that an operating system can use for whatever. And so while there is going to be a little bit of interaction with the segmentation in the IDT, that's again part of the reason why we learned about segmentation first, conceptually I find it helpful to just think of the IDT like it's a big table of function pointers or function far pointers as the case may be. So interrupt zero will have a function pointer associated with it. Interrupt one will have a function pointer. Interrupt two will have a function pointer. So you just kind of think of it like when interrupt zero fires, it goes to the function pointer pointed to by interrupt zero. So again, IDT register points at the base. Then there's the IDT, which has entries inside of it. And I said there is segmentation used here. So inside of the IDT entries, as we'll see in the next section, there is a far pointer. So it is having a segment selector inside of there. And it's going to select something from the GDT or LDT. But because this is used for code execution, and because you're ultimately you know, trying to find some interrupt procedure to run, well, that means that you know, the actual base address of the segment is ignored because code segments are always just treated as if they have a base of zero. So it's really going to be a base of zero, a limit of 2 to the 64 minus 1. And the part that is used here from the GDT are the access control bits. So if you're trying to call a particular interrupt, there's going to be checks for access control on the interrupt gate itself, as well as the ultimate destination segment where that interrupt gate points at. So access control is still in effect. Base addresses being reconfigurable is not. So just a quick skim through the interrupts that are actually reserved by Intel. Interrupt 0 is a divide error. So if you divide by 0, you get interrupt 0. Interrupt 1 is a debug error exception, which has to do with hardware interrupts, as we'll see later on. There's the non-maskable interrupt. There's a breakpoint. This is used for software breakpoints in 3, as we'll dig into a little more later on. And overflow had to do with that int O. UD has to do with UD2 instruction. Uh, do, 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 do various invalid conditions. The general protection fault, interrupt vector 13, is by far the most common type of problem that can occur. You see sort of everywhere when you're reading the manual for assembly instructions, you'll see, you know, if this goes wrong, general protection fault. If this goes wrong, general protection fault. 
And then page fault is an extremely common one as well, but we're going to learn about that in the paging section later on. All right, and then, you know, other miscellaneous, only interesting ones are this one used for virtualization for extended page tables and control protection exception. Fairly sure this wasn't here when I made the class before because this has to do with CET, control flow enforcement technology, the new security mechanism. And so for all of these exceptions and interrupts, there are actually individual manual pages for each of them starting in section 615 if you wanna go dig into those. Now, just a little bit about terminology that I have to mention now that we have seen references both to segmentation and to faults, right? So we saw in the, in the very first interrupt section, you know, Hitler RIP pointing at the instruction which is faulting. Well, segmentation faults are neither to do with segmentation in the Intel x86 sense of the word or faults in the Intel x86 sense of the world. The reality is most segmentation errors actually generate a general protection fault, and segmentation isn't used to protect memory, it's actually paging, so it's page faults that occur most of the time. So seg fault is actually a Unix signal, the sig seg v, and signals are just an OS abstraction, so this fault is not actually an x86 fault. Basically, you would expect that Unix systems are going to use these signals when they run on various different architectures, x86, Spark, DEC, Honeywell, you know, who knows, whatever, whatever things. I suppose ARM as well. All right, so what did we learn in this section? Well, we learned the general principle that there is a thing called the IDT, but we didn't learn what's inside of it. We did learn that the IDT register is going to point at the base of the IDT. So let's continue on to the next section and figure out what is the stuff inside the IDT.